if you go on stage and you act like you're better than everyone else if they decide they don't find you amusing then they hate you whereas if you go on stage and you're low status even if your jokes aren't funny people will kind of feel oh, out poor bloke <laughs> Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve every aspect of your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a prolific stand-up comedian whose list of entertainment credits spans across radio, television and the stage. When he isn't selling out shows across the country, you can find him on BBC One's Live at the Apollo, Channel 4's Stand Up for the Week, and his own BBC Radio 4 series, Simon Evans Goes to Market. In addition to making crowds cackle with his comedy on stage and screen, he has amassed an impressive list of credits in the writers' rooms for shows like The Big Breakfast, Eight out of ten cats are not going out, just to name a few. It would be a mistake to underestimate him as simply a funny man. He is also a past winner of Celebrity Mastermind and a participant on University Challenge, where he represented his alma mater, Southampton University. Simon Evans, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you very much, Paul. And before we go any further, I'm going to add I also represented the comedian's professional uh, cohort on University Challenge. And they have various sort of iterations of the Christmas special. So I've been on it twice, but never as a student, unfortunately. And did you win? No, we lost as the comedians to the Ministry of Justice, who I'd never even heard of prior to that. I thought that was something out of 1984, but they apparently were a real department and they were very well informed and they steamloaded us and then they won the entire competition. They won the series. Um, but we did win our, our, um, our heat when I was representing Southampton as old boys, old boys and girls, but um, but not by enough to get into the semi-final. You have to, they only take the best four winners out of the... Yeah, so... I've got third time lucky and I'm going to have to re-enter university now. I'm going to have to go back like Rodney Dangerfield and uh, become an old boy once we get to have that third third crack at the whip. And what would your subject be, which you would study your third time, given a choice? Because well, you did law first time, didn't you? Yes, that's a very good question. If I went back to university now, I think I would try and get something that had a bit of a philosophical bent. But then, I mean, Lord, actually, although I, you know, I went into study law thinking I was going to be a lawyer, I knew within minutes that it wasn't <laughs> it made a terrible error. But I sort of carried on uh, just accruing it in, in sort of... Um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's a way of understanding human nature, isn't it? Studying law. It's a way of understanding uh, attempts to mitigate human nature and to keep it, you know, to apply constraints, but not too many and so on. So it has a philosophical edge. I'd like to go back and study something like philosophy, some philosophy and literature, and maybe combine philosophy, literature and neurology, neuroscience. There's a chap doing that called Ian McGilchrist, who's written some amazing books and does a lot of podcasts talking about it. And it's, I find kind of cross uh, disciplinary, polymathic kind of people very interesting. Now, I think that's where the most interesting conversations take place, actually. No, oh, that's fascinating. No, I, I, I love and you must tell me about Ian Gilchrist's books on neuroscience because mm. I haven't come across them yet. So, Well, his uh, big one is called The Master and His Emissary, and it's about the two sides of the brain. And he has theories about why we have a left and a right hemisphere and why they are actually subtly different in their way of understanding and framing the world. It's, it really is fascinating. Oh, I love that kind of stuff. Anyway, you grew up as an only child in St. Albans. Yes, um, I did. We'll get on to the only child thing a little bit later <laughs> on, I hope. Uh, uh, was was humour actually valued in your family? It really was, actually. Yeah. But sometimes when I think, why did I become a stand-up? You know, and it's one of those questions you get asked on everything from local radio, obviously, to, you know, podcasts. But, um, you know, th th that whole were you a class clown thing, I don't know necessarily that I, that I engaged with it that much, but it was definitely a way in which I understood that I could connect with my father you know, uh, and uh, for, for other reasons, as you say, that you're intended to come on to later, I realise in hindsight why some of those attempts to connect with him weren't always as successful as others. 
But one thing I always registered was just how much he enjoyed good uh, BBC sitcoms, how much he enjoyed Morecambe and Wise and The Two Ronnies and Last of the Summer Why and, you know, what would be regarded as very mainstream and obvious stuff. He didn't have like a cultivated connoisseur's taste in comedy, perhaps, but it was hugely therapeutic for him at the end of a working day to come home and sit down in front of the telly. He would always have a little wooden board on his lap and he was always building a, a model aeroplane. He was never just like slumped in front of the telly with a, with a beer and a fag. He would always have some model on the go, but, um, but yeah, the, the, the big comedy shows, Les Dawson, he was very fond of Wogan, you know, and, and the blankety blank kind of panel games or that a whole thing was huge part of um of of what we regarded as culture really you know that was about as far as we went we didn't we weren't a particularly bookish household we weren't uh, i don't think i ever saw them going to the theater i think my mum was slightly frustrated that my dad had no interest in leaving the house after 6 p.m you know but uh yeah comedy was a big part of i think it kept him sane you know as much as anything else you know it's it, it was i registered at quite an early age that it was an important release for for tensions and um stresses and and was that also a big bonding mechanism between you and your father um, as, as yeah, well? I would say so. I would say if I I remember like probably a lot of kids lying flat on my belly on the on the rug in the middle of the living room while my parents were in armchairs watching the telly. I'd be on the floor with a dog, and I remember seeing like a, a sketch on on the two Ronnies registering that the audience laughed and then looking to my dad to see if he'd laughed as well and feeling that that you know, I mean a lot of people do that look to see if somebody they're with laughs and and share that laugh I remember looking back and forth between him and the telly and enjoying it more if he was laughing and also he had this habit you could argue slightly annoying <laughs> of laughing ahead of the joke when he saw it coming you know to let you know that he he'd got it but he would <laughs> see that definitely as a, as a, a tribute to the writing because it, Oh yes, I can. See, you know what I mean. That kind of. I know where this is going. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man's up a ladder cleaning windows, and we've already <laughs> seen the ladies in the shower. You know. So. <laughs> Was there an element whereby you could see? Okay, this is a really impo- important cultural thing to be able to use humour, uh, and therefore it's important to me, and it's going to be important to me in life. I think partly, and I would certainly say. Maybe retrospectively, once I realised how much I enjoyed also making people laugh, I don't know whether it's the same reason. I think to some extent, centering yourself on stage is more egotistical than that. And I wouldn't want to say I only wanted to do it because I'd seen how much it helped my dad. You know, I'm not I'm not going to create a sort of saintly <laughs> justification. <laughs> But I do think I I registered this is good and this is a nice thing to do. The, you know, this is there are lots of professions where you can make lots of money um, if you don't really care who you trample over. And then there are other professions where you can, uh, you know, like caring for people where you're not necessarily going to get huge remuneration, but you will have the satisfaction of knowing that you've made a difference in somebody's life. Humor seemed to me to be a, a really I felt from quite an early age that there was a there was a nice kind of intersection there. You know, there was it was the opportunity to make people's lives better, to to spread a little joy and happiness or or a little bit of warmth and human connection, and also potentially to become rich and famous, which, you know, I didn't want to uh, eliminate the possibility of, you know. So I think I registered at an early age that there was that was that was an appealing p- profession because I didn't ever really want to have um, a regular, traditional, conventional job. I, I, I really shied away from those from an early age. Well, what was that um, laziness? <laughs> because a lot of comedians, obviously, both of us know hundreds of comedians and thing. Is that sort of or because I thought, I, like you, I thought it seemed like an easier way to go. Yeah. Uh, well, it's the, shorter hours, uh, certainly, isn't it? You know. <laughs> oh yeah, and you go. Uh, you're, I'm going to go and do a twenty minute set, and somebody's going to give me a hundred pounds or whatever it was. I mean, I think to be fair, when I first started doing stand up, I didn't actually intend it to be a living at all. I thought what I, who I wanted to be really was Alan Corrin or John Mortimer, somebody like that, somebody who had respectful middle class quite uh establishment in a way but without having to be a, a barrister or a, an accountant or a gp so i i wanted to write that that was i thought i pictured myself spending my days with my typewriter in an agreeable study with a, a globe which would open to reveal a few bottles of you know mid-price scotch <laughs> around four o'clock in the afternoon and um and that's what I thought would be like the good life. I still think that's the good life, you know, and, and a lot of my heroes are people who have established a study for themselves, as simple as that. You know, I've, there's a picture I cherish of Roger Scruton in his study. 
which is p- possibly as much as I you know can tell you about his philosophy and his uh, arguments in favor of beauty and conservation and so on it's really just ah oh, yeah there's a man whose study is uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> so stand up is of course the opposite of that because you spend time in your car you spend time on the trains and then you spend time in the most dismal dressing rooms i still to this day think the public have no idea quite how grim 99 percent of dressing rooms even in quite nice theaters let alone yes. the ones that i get to play you know so um you know it, it didn't provide that i really got into stand up as a way of testing material of honing my edge you know that's what i thought it would be i regarded it more as the gym rather than the the playing field really but um, but it soon started paying in a way that that uh, writing columns and so on, you know, manifestly hadn't. I could earn more in 20 minutes on a Thursday night than I could in the entire week, you know, writing off um, 200 words of supposedly amusedly sort of diary entries for the local paper or whatever. So, you know, the truth is there are many more stand up comedians earning a living at any given point than there ever were Alan Corrins or, or John Mortimer's. And, and that was before you know, digital media made um, the whole journalistic, you know, the whole of Fleet Street now is c- completely cratered. And we're quite lucky. I mean, I think I'm very lucky and to have sort of almost randomly chosen or found myself in a profession which does demand live attendance by an audience. And so you can still make them pay. You originally, as you just said, wanted to be a writer. What was the catalyst? Because I think you've said to me once before that you went and saw some improv. Was it spontaneous combustion yes. or something? It was and, spontaneous combustion, yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. With, well, with remember, Luke yeah. Zorba. Was it with Luke Zorba? That's right. Luke Zorba with an S, not Zorba. Like a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stick of him bouncing down there. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, yeah. yeah. The Greek version. Yes. yes. <laughs> he, him, Stella Duffy, and uh, who were the others? Uh, Alison Goldie and Niall something. I wasn't Ferguson. That was the historian, isn't it? Something like that. Anyway, I can't remember. And um, they they were a great bunch. Five yeah. five very funny people. Yes, it was a local paper. I I did a um essentially I, I went away. You know, I, I had a job for a few years after university selling advertising space. I had a vague sense that I wanted to get into the publishing industry, but I thought if I get a sense of how it works before I then maybe can set up a magazine. This was just before the internet. If I'd waited a couple of years, I could have launched a website and I would have been fine. You know, but <laughs> I was just at the sort of the fag end of 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 publishing. So I had something in mind more like. Halfway between Danny Baker's sniffing glue punk fanzine, oh, you know, Private Eye and the Olympia Press in Paris in the 60s, who published things like Ulysses and, uh, you know, uh, Tropic of Cancer and stuff, you know. So I was had slightly high flown ideas about <laughs> what I, where I, my position would be in the, in the London. I wanted to have salons and that kind of thing. I just wanted there to be conversations in my life all the time, you know. So, um yeah, I did a few years of selling ad space. I worked in Soho. It was great fun drinking in the pubs of Soho. The sandwich bars of Soho alone were good enough reason to work there. But but eventually I realized I was being sucked into the corporate funnel, you know, rather than the uh, the creative go it alone kind of uh, path I'd wanted to take. So I, I jacked it in, went traveling for a year with about, had about a thousand pounds in my pocket, booked a one way flight to Karachi and managed to survive for about 14 months on that. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, doing a little bit of, of work of one kind or another, very, very itinerant. And um, and then when I came back, I thought, right, I'm never going to have a proper job again. I'm absolutely determined to make sure that happens. Writing has been I think that's a key skill. And, I, you know, I would say as a stand up, you need to be able to write. So I did a short course at the London College of Printing, which was in specifically in periodical journalism. So features and so on for magazines rather than you know, reporting. And, uh, and they also taught what they already knew were redundant and archaic skills like page layout, which was already being done, you know, by software at the click of a button. But, you know, they taught you how to how to set old type and so on. And it was fun. Three months there was great fun. And um, and off the back of that, I started doing a few pieces for local papers. And one of them was the Camden and St Pancras Chronicle. And they asked me to write a story about this workshop that people were doing just for fun, really, on improvised comedy. Whose Line Is It Anyway was on the telly at the time. It was about 94, I think. Um, Clive Anderson had become very famous and all the performers like uh, Steve Frost and Mike McShane and so on. And um, and I was I love that show. So I thought, yeah, OK, why don't I have a go at that? There were people like John Sessions as well, who had actually been to my school, John Sessions. He was a few years older than me, but not many. And I just thought he was amazing, absolutely brilliant. You know, I was staggered by his genius. As time wore on, 
you learn with improv, of course, there are certain tricks that they do know, you know, it's, it's not like they're not making up every shot from scratch, but you know, that's how, that's how genius operates, isn't it? But um, yeah, so I went along and wrote that story and signed up for a full length course. And I did about two years of improv before somebody sort of nudged me into stand up. Oh, that's really interesting because I, I, I don't know if you know, but I, I uh, was one of the original guests with the comedy store players and we right. were all taught all the games by Mike Myers. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, and there was me and uh, Neil Malarkey, Josie Lawrence, Paul Merton, um, Kit Holler back at the time, yeah. um, it, all, all those people. And we used to go in the afternoons and Mike would teach us all the Second City games. I was going to say he was Second City, which was like that. That was the kind of Florence in the Renaissance of, of improv, wasn't it, really? Yeah. I had Neil Malarkey on the show. Uh, uh, and there's some interesting parallels, I think, with what business can learn uh, about business. And Neil teaches this. Um, yeah. From improv, what what do you think improv can teach you uh, generally in business? It's it's a really good question. I've I've bought a couple of books over the years, actually three or four, which I've read, which have attempted to answer that question and harness improv and and use it as a teaching aid for whatever amounts to self help in a corporate setting, or whatever. And I think they're of limited use and help. I have to say, but I think if you actually are in it, it, like engage with it physically. It's one of those things. It's very hard to get off the page. It's very hard to put into useful practical terms uh, in a lecture or in a, a presentation. It's a thing you learn by doing it. But when you actually do it, you experience quite shocking realizations uh, about the nature of status and dependency and uh, uh, games people play. I mean, you know, in any social setting. I remember one of the very first things Luke Sorber taught me in improv, but again, you had to sort of see it happen in scenes to make it, un to understand it, was that in any good scene, and this can be in Chekhov or Shakespeare or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross or whatever, you know, there have to be... People enter the scene with a, something they want to get out of it. And over the course of the scene, there is a wrangling. These people, it might be completely unconscious. They might not know what they want, what they're trying to get out of it. And a status has to shift within the course of that scene. So if it's just two people, the simplest example, you and I come in and, uh, you know, you have, uh, you're the boss and I'm the employee and you want me to do some overtime. And by the end of the scene, I've agreed to do the overtime, but you are now in my back pocket. You, I have some whammy over you, which is going to obviously have ramifications for the future. It's just these constant transactions. And you realize that these are, this sort of thing is going on all the time in, an, in a business environment, also in a family environment. There's a great book which doesn't attempt to use improv, but kind of is imbued with it which is called your brain at work i don't know if you've ever encountered that it's a very interesting book about the again the kind of neuroscience to some extent or and the heuristics and so on that people use to get through the workday and it's particularly acute and insightful about the, the degree to which status is important to people status is uh, is uh, is how people understand their role and their position in the world you know and it's why kids want to grow up and leave home and that kind of stuff you know because you want to get somewhere where your status is elevated and of course, we live in a society where advertisers and so on absolutely prey on that. And, and at the same time, there's a lot of guilt about it because people think, oh, God, did I just buy that car because it's a status symbol? You know, well, maybe you did. You know, we all need them. <laughs> so how important is status to you in the things? Because I think that the comedians are very high status even though they don't conform to the norms of everything, because you're allowed, I, I always found this, that we were allowed into mm. any strata of society and treated as an equal, whereas yeah. you, you couldn't be a plumber and, and make that shift, but somehow comedians are allowed to make that shift. Well, they are outsiders, aren't they? I think they're understood as outsiders. They're understood as uh, somebody might say tricksters or whatever. You know, they have that kind of shame. I know Stuart Lee wrote a whole book sort of tracing his understanding of the profession. He's entered back to the uh, North American uh, native uh, shaman. Is it from that tradition or is it? It may be from somewhere else. But anyway, you know, witch doctors or all that kind of stuff. You know, as a comedian, you are slightly outside of the rules. You have that extra license. Lear's fool and so on. 
But I do also think it's interesting, it's very interesting to me, status as played on stage. I didn't, I don't think consciously choose to play a high status individual on stage, but that's how I ended up. Certainly I am, a, a, I play very high status most of the time. And only in the last few years, I've dropped my status. And now I'm more of a kind of like a Galton and Simpson character, you know, like a Steptoe or a, or a, a Hancock, you know, somebody who's a bit put upon by the world, you know, oh, bloody hell, oh, would you believe it? You know, whereas I always used to be, like stainless steel rising above it you know my 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 spats wouldn't touch the dirt on the in the in the on the pavement you know there was that sense that i would just float above all the the uh, i see there are homeless in this part of the of the world what a shame you know that kind of <laughs> how terribly distressing anyway moving on you know that kind of attitude which was very risky it's a high risk strategy because if you go on stage and you act like you're better than everyone else if they decide they don't find you amusing then they hate you whereas if you go on stage and you're low status even if your jokes aren't funny people will kind of feel oh, out poor bloke you know he's, he's having it rough but somebody like daniel kitson for instance who was a brilliant stand up and went very yes. much his own way his status was as low as it could be i mean he would genuinely draw attention to the fact that he he did physically resemble the classic pedophile you know he had thick glasses and a <laughs> straggly sort of Beard and, and and he was disheveled and he started earning a lot of money you know and he could very easily have afforded decent grooming and to smarten himself up you know not necessarily lose weight but he could certainly have just presented differently but he didn't want to it was important to him to sustain that you know somebody like eddie izzard i think struggled a little bit when he first became really successful because a lot of his material was about not just the minutiae of everyday life but really quite you know the laundrette and that sort of thing well you think come on eddie you don't go to the laundrette you've earned like 15 grand tonight you know <laughs> and um and it's difficult. And he found, you know, an outlet through, um, uh, you know, unconventional clothing, which has evolved over time. And, you know, wherever it's taken him, I don't I, I, I still have slight doubts about the extent to which he's in control of that now. But there's a there's there's a there's a, a danger for all comedians who start out with low status when they become successful. Stuart Lee, who I mentioned earlier now, is playing five nights at the Dome in Brighton, which is our kind of premier comedy. I, I don't think I've ever seen another comedian like do a run there of anything approaching five nights that's puts him in the absolute first rank of of comedians in terms of success and yet he will amble onto the stage you know still looking as if he's a runner for the nme you know and uh but you know t-boy and uh <laughs> making no attempt to conceal or buy decent tailoring to mitigate his uh, slightly portly status and so on. So, you know, it's, it's status is absolutely key and it's, it's key to your proposition as a comedian. I'm not accusing any of these people of being hypocrites. I'm just saying, if you nice. want to make the comedy work, you have to be aware of your status and you have to present it and project it with confidence. You know, you have to know how you're going to be perceived and the audience will allow all of that to melt away they will allow the fact that Stuart lee will earn getting on for 100 grand over the course of that week in brighton they will allow that to fade away and he would be allowed to present himself as somebody who is still struggling to get by in stoke newington it's it's very interesting status isn't it because um you could say that trump in america um said he had low status and he was a man of the people and and yeah. he was firing against all the the people who were in charge and and you were going what? <laughs> well, it's, that is very interesting as well, because Americans and the Brits have a slightly different notion of money and class. For the British, money and class are entirely different things. You can certainly be very wealthy and have no class, and you can be very uh, high class and utterly on destitute. There was a wonderful TV documentary years ago about, I think they were called the fucking Fullertons or something like that. They were a family oh, yes. that swore relentlessly and they had a really ramshackle old stately home in Devon that was leaking and it had dry rot and all the rest of it. But they were clearly, you know, proper came over with the, with William the Conqueror aristocrats, you know. So Trump is a kind of uber example of that. Very, very wealthy. Although, of course, the money is like on a thin veneer. Yeah. You do think you can he could he could flip over at any moment or he could have done before he was president. A lot of people, I think, quite plausibly say that his his desire to be in the White House was as much as anything a sort of shoring up of his <laughs> against, yes. you know, him in a bankruptcy. But um but no class at all. But Americans see that different. You see, they think of that as quite noble. Whereas I think if we're honest, most Brits have more affection for a down at heel aristocrat than they do for a, uh, a nouveau, you know, somebody who's made several million out of selling widgets, you know, uh, car phone warehouse millionaires, those kind of people um, without being 
I don't know, without having any of the sort of manners or the taste or knowing how to to open an oyster. Do you know what I mean? I, it's, <laughs> I, I just observe that this it's is a different chuck an oyster, you. just so we're clear. <laughs> 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 just showing I, my I, status there. It's very good. Is that what you do with them? Oh, I remember it came into my head because I was reading a bit of Woodhouse yesterday and he had, I can't, was it Roderick Spode had the had an eye that could open an oyster at 20 paces? <laughs> <laughs> he really beady look at you. It might not have been Spode. But anyway, he, um, he Trump, represented for Americans the the kind of principle, I mean, not all Americans, of course, but a distressingly large number, the, the, the principle that you can create yourself as a wealthy go-getting man there's nothing to be afraid of and nothing to be ashamed of and his vulgarity his tie worn too long his fondness for diet coke and mcdonald's burgers you know was 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 exemplary was was like a throwback to the good old days the norman rockwell days you know of every man being able to have a level gaze when he encounters the president you know but uh, but uh, i'm intrigued by this whole uh element of class and everything and in this country i mean obviously we for comedic terms so many of our comedies have been built on class is it but is that i mean you can't really name many which aren't about you know last and we go back to the frost report with john cleese and the two ronnies well that was pretty on the nose wasn't it but i mean earlier than that again i mentioned gorton and simpson who i regard as you know probably the shakespeare shakespeare and shakespeare of of uh of the comedy (laughs) writing fraternity their their creation their characters and i i would also probably add in Maybe Nobbs understood it as well. And um, God, I've, I've forgotten it. I wrote an obituary for him about a year ago as well, the chap who created Rigsby. But because uh, Rigsby is an extraordinary, I mean, he's Dickensian, really, Rigsby. He is uh, very much like Fawlty. He is absolutely paralyzed by snobbery. So it's not just that he has class and he's aware of it. He desperately wants to demonstrate and achieve solid middle class status. And he clearly isn't. He clearly doesn't have the right to regard himself in that light. You know, but everyone else around him, as as with Forty, is comfortable with their status, with their class, and and he is absolutely spasming with with embarrassment. And then, I mean, Steptoe. You know, you had that the main driver of Steptoe was that young Steptoe desperately wanted to be a, a respectable, you know, individual, and and his father was quite as happy as as a pig in shit, quite literally. And the the irony, of course, was being that Harry H. Corbett was a bit like that he wanted to be a Shakespearean actor he didn't want to be regarded as Steptoe you know so he inhabited that role with it with (laughs) an extraordinary close fit but yeah I mean so it's not just class it's it's about the comedy comes from anyone who is not comfortable with their class and and actually that's not entirely like unique to Britain people who lack self-awareness are funny all around the world it's just that class is a subtle thing so it's quite easy and plausible for somebody to not quite understand how the rest of the world sees them and for and for the the humor to rise from that in america it might be for instance and i'm just off the top of my head it might be a man, a young man or woman who has a deluded notion of how attractive they are what what a you know what what catnip they are for the ladies or whatever it might be somebody who who believes that they're a great businessman but yeah but well, that's a trotter of course but they're always going bust you've got to have delusions to be a comic character anyone who understands themselves well you can make a great comedy around them but they won't be the you know that's kind of seinfeld i guess he was sort of the only one in that show that wasn't funny right yeah, but uh, I'm I'm interested because of of how we react to class and and from a, a humor thing we do we seem in the UK more pedestal you know you'll put people on a pedestal uh, based on their their class and it's very hard to move classes here but yeah. you've managed to move classes because <laughs> you well but but. I, I'm interested, and I think I have as well, because my father was a Hungarian refugee, and, the, and my mother was an East End of Glasgow. So, it, I obviously have, but you have as well, in the sense that you were brought up as an only child in St Albans and a fair mm. state school. But then, you obviously saw something or modelled something in in psychological terms that 
could elevate your status. And it, was that the voice? What What do you think that is? Well, that's you mean in terms of the character I present on stage? Because I don't know whether I've shifted class in terms of how I actually live. Maybe a little bit, you know, but but not like a, a massive leap. Well, you're not chucking oysters yet, to be honest with you. So I... <laughs> my uh, my parents made a more significant change. You know, my my grandparents were really solidly working class like yours, and um, one of them, you know, worked all life in a rubber factory and got the full silicosis of the lung, and the other one was a, was a council gardener, or and then a gardener for you know just a. Um, I think it was the electricity board headquarters, you know, so just a classic wheeling wheelbarrow of leaves sort of level of gardener. And my father, you know, has, uh, made himself um, lower middle class, which is, of course, a, 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 an easy subject for derision and the Betjeman style sort of snobbery against it. But that's a more significant change, really. Uh, then it's just a question of degree after that, how many books you put on your shelf or whatever. But the, the character I present on stage, who is... I think, um, yes, I mean, my earliest sort of signature joke was about if you can't place my accent, it, it is in fact educated. The implication being that it was privately <laughs> educated, but it wasn't, you know. Yeah. So I was, as with a lot of things, I was really just reflecting back what people seem to see and hear in me as a stand up. You know, when I first started out as a stand up, I love the idea that you could do jokes and make observations and people laughed. But I hadn't quite understood the extent to which you need to present a coherent and strong, almost cartoonishly simplified, you know, profile, a silhouette, if you like. And um, and then I started noticing that some material I do, the audience would immediately go, ah, yes, that's really you, isn't it? You're like that, you know. And then, and then other material, they go, mm, no, we don't really believe that you would have had that conversation or that you would feel that way if that happened, you know. And and they're right most of the time. I mean, it is an odd thing. You know, I didn't have to create a lie, but it's a particular facet, I suppose, that they just find about you that that that, that works. Where that came from, I suspect, was studying law. I suspect that studying law at Southampton, which isn't like a, as prestigious as Oxbridge, was a good faculty, though. And um, I would say about 95% of the student cohort there were privately educated. So that was when I was thrown in amongst them. And when I was looking for, I suppose, a little bit of a carapace, a little bit of a shield, a bit of distance for a character to play on stage, I'd registered that a lot of them seemed to be very confident, witty, sharp, able to hold the table, you know, and uh, and I borrowed that, I think, to some extent. And now, as I say, going back now, a lot of the people I find funniest are the few remaining East End Spurs fans, you know, that you encounter sometimes randomly in a pub in St. James's uh, watching a game of footy on the TV, you know, and I thought, oh, no, I'll tell you what it is, Simon. You see what you've got to understand. You know, that those people, I find them funny because they seem incredibly comfortable in themselves and confident and anchored. Uh, you know, they're like trees, you know, some of these people who uh, they have none of that kind of anxiety that the middle classes nowadays have. I think there's terrible anxiety in this country at the moment, more than there was, funnily enough, in the 70s era of Rigsby and, and Fulty, because I think people are anxious about class. Yes, but also about race. They're anxious about are they a, are men a part of the patriarchy? We're worried about toxic masculinity. They're, they're, everyone is worried about whether they've you know demonstrated their virtue or not any number of uh, uh, metrics. Uh, we used to have much less of that kind of uh, thing to be worried about. You were basically just worried about whether you were earning enough. You know, thirty yeah. years ago, it's got it's well, got a lot worse since then. Well, you had more basic basic things to to concern yourself with. I'm, I'm interested yeah. about the confidence angle because uh, obviously uh, it's all about humor. This podcast, but every aspect of humor, and I, I think in order to to be good at humour, you have to have an element of confidence, don't you? You have to know where you're coming from. You have to feel that you can put these points across. You have to feel confident enough to actually give your opinion across. So how can people develop that kind of confidence in order to uh, be more humorous, I suppose? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I do think you're right. There's almost nothing worse in a comedian than they are nervous, even if they are funny and the audience is laughing. If they don't believe it themselves, you pick up on that and you start to feel bad for them and, and, and everyone feels uncomfortable. I think the primary responsibility of a comedian is to reassure everyone that they're fine. <laughs> you know, yeah. Even if you don't find me funny, I'll live. 
Well, but no, if, that, that's terms... true because from a psychological perspective, you know, I'm always saying to people that if you want anyone to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. And yeah. so, and and one of the examples I always give is, have you ever been to a, a a comedy show? And they go, yes. And they go, have you ever been when the comedian is dying or nervous on stage? And everybody will do the same look, which is, mm. oh my God, yes. Yeah, and yeah. they 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 literally convulse with just the the memory of it. So it yeah. is something about you have to have that kind of confidence. Sorry, I interrupted you, but no, no, it's fine. I I think it's quite interesting that a lot of the comedians that come across as most confident, Jack D, for instance, who I, I never saw in the early days, but apparently used to present as quite a comical character. You know, a much more I, cheerful I, and engaging character. Yes, but he really landed when he started to come on. It was immediately grumpy, and part of that is its confidence, isn't it? What you pick up on if a comedian comes on stage and immediately looks sour, angry, disappointed, like they're about to complain, you know that they're confident because they are not trying to kind of go, "Hey, we're all having a laugh, aren't we? It's all a bit of a laugh. It's nice to get out of the house, isn't it? It's nice, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> that is funny too. You know that kind of Max Miller thing. All right, ladies, it's only a bit of a laugh, isn't it? But it, but it's. It's more confident, really, or all other things being equal to come and go, oh, bloody hell, you know, and that because, you know, the audience immediately know, well, this chap believes he's got good material because he's not trying to sort of, you know, butter the uh, the parsnips with just like a smiling face and a happy attitude. So. I, I mean, I found early on when I, I'll be honest with you, I, I was confident. I was quite naturally confident. So I might not be the best person to, you know, offer therapeutic advice for those who suffer. I, if anything, I've probably erred on the side of being oblivious to the fact that I might not be going down well, not even on just on stage, but sometimes in company and so on as well, um, rather than the other way around. Do you know what I mean? I, I tend to be... Uh, a little bit um, ebullient sometimes, you know, and and uh, and I might not notice that other people are uh, getting a bit tired of me or something, you know. So I've never really had that problem. Um, and as a stand-up, I think I was very lucky that the first two gigs I did went really well, by you know, by any standards that I could have expected. And then I was off and running. And I had a few deaths, obviously, after that. But if those first two gigs had been deaths, I might have struggled. I might have lost all my confidence and retreated back into my shell. But instead, I was flying. You know, it was like it's like your first skydive. You it works, and you just think, wow, that's amazing. But what I do remember is sort of channeling other comedians. I do remember thinking, I mean, funny enough, Seinfeld, although I'm nothing like him, but I did used to like the way his sitcom, which was around exactly as I started in 96, that was quite a big thing, would always start with three or four minutes of him in a club talking about the kind of material that was going to be explored in the series, in the in the show that was coming up. And even though his stand-up wasn't amazing, really, in those sort of two or three minutes, it was very confident. You know, he was just floating an idea and kind of going... Because people always like mock that observational humor. McIntyre is another one they kind of tease and, and ridicule for kind of going, oh, it's just like, have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed? You know, that was uh, Coogan's thing, wasn't it? Have you ever noticed yeah. how when you yeah. get home, the back of your blazer is covered in spit? <laughs> and uh, and that was, you know, it was. But the thing is, there is bravery in that material because you are taking a risk. Other people may not have noticed it or they may think that you're a bit weird for noticing it or you're a bit creepy or you're maybe a little bit of a fascist for noticing that. Do you know what I mean? And there are, and the rules are changing constantly now. So there's always a little bit of, um, a little bit more courage than is maybe immediately obvious to people when you are doing that kind of material. And I think that came out with Seinfeld that he had that courage. He had the conviction that you know his observations. He was going to get there. You know, the first couple of lines might not be hilarious, but then when the twist came, it would work. And so I sort of literally thought i'm i'm going to do a seinfeld impression nobody's going to understand they're not i'm not going to do the voice i'm not going to do the accent but that's who i'm going to feel i'm being you know and I, I, boys have been doing that with footballers and so on for years haven't they i mean it's a pretty natural way of doing it by the way in 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 psychology we would talk about that as modeling somebody right and yeah. uh, i and i i'm always saying go the easy route model you just talked about modeling Seinfeld I once heard an interview with uh, Paul McCartney who's hopefully coming on this show soon uh, wow. but uh, but McCartney said we were terrified in the early days of the Beatles 
because we thought that everybody would realize that some of our early songs we were copying yeah. uh, Motown songs or, or or something. Well, they and, literally did like Chuck Berry songs and Buddy Holly songs and stuff, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did them. But obviously, what happens is you go in with that attitude, but it comes out completely differently. Yeah, because yeah. it goes through you. But I actually think it's one of those things that actually everybody should realize that it's easier to actually go. I'll go in with a Seinfeld attitude or, or, or this attitude and see what happens, because then you can borrow confidence. I think that's really true. I, I remember an Elvis Costello quote that I read in a magazine many years ago and I've said it my son is learning electric guitar now he's about 15 he's got a band with his mates you know and he's like starting to get how are we going to write songs how are we going to be original and I always said oh, I wouldn't worry about that just for now you know this uh, the Costello quote was something along the lines of all worthwhile progress in music is made by uh, musicians trying to copy their favorite their their, their heroes and getting it slightly wrong and, and it's yeah. just the way you get it slightly wrong that moves things on. Anytime there's a handful of people who maybe make serious innovations, maybe the edge with his guitar technique, you know, or something wasn't. But even then, it's often if you actually ask them or if you dig into it, you find, ah, oh, well, what he was doing was he was kind of copying this musician who isn't in the mainstream of rock or doesn't even play a guitar. You know, he was trying to make his guitar sound like tubular bells or something. And um you know, like the Beatles, as you mentioned, McCartney, astonishing levels of creativity in the mid 60s. But a lot of that came from like listening to Bernard Cribbins records or Spike Milligan or, you know, uh, Stockhausen. You know, they were listening to wider range of things when they started out. They were listening to Buddy Holly and, and Chuck Berry. And and by the mid 60s, they were listening to a much wider range of, of musical influences. And it was having an effect. You don't have to try to be original. You just have to allow the influences that you've been exposed to. And that's where I think originality comes from. It's the it's the originality of your listening choices rather than what you choose to say, if you see what I mean. No, I know. I think that's brilliant. And I, I, I recently read a, a wonderful article uh, by you uh, where you said that comedy shares with music a dependency on rhythm often yeah. referred to as timing, though this arguably evokes only the correct pause before the punchline arrives. And really, there's a lot more to that. What else do you feel that comedy and music have in common? Well, that's a very good question. God, that that's a huge, deep... I mean, in that article as well, I was drawing comparisons and also saying this is the distinction, one of which is that music, good music, seems to be timeless. You know, there's very little music. There's some pop that excites you when you're a teenager and after which you realise it's a bit shallow. But most great pop from the 60s we still recognise as great, but Bacharach and the Beatles and uh, and the Motown is still understood to be yeah, absolutely timeless, let alone sort of Mozart and Beethoven, you know, whereas most comedy, in truth, does date quite quickly. But I think when you're in the in the immediate presence of a good stand-up in a comedy club there's a kind of rhythm and it is partly I think it's like surfing a little bit I mean that's quite a big part of it every comedian knows that they have to be able to play the audience they're in front of you couldn't possibly just deliver your your set at the same speed every night you have to be kind of rolling with it you're trying to catch the catch the peak and then and then like carrying on the next one you know and the waves are coming in off the back of the wall sometimes and they're not always creating the same rhythm as you're getting from the front row and that can be tricky in itself you know the first couple of times but I remember I toured with Lee Mack in 2010 and he was playing 3,000 seaters some of which weren't really very well designed 3,000 seaters they were like corn exchanges that had oh, I know 500 rows Rows, you know, <laughs> all the way to the back, you know, whereas if you have a nice like five tier Victorian theatre holding 3000 people like Sunderland Empire, then then it's great. Everyone's almost equidistant. You know, you're almost playing to the to, uh, you know, from the centre of a sphere. But um, but these ones where the people at the back of the room are literally getting the joke half a half a second later, and then their their laughter is reaching you another half a second later, no. and that's enough to really throw the timing out, you know, because you're playing to the front row, and then just halfway through the next line, the laugh comes in from the previous one, you know. But rhythm of it, I think, is partly it is like a dance. It, uh, I mean, part of the the um, skill of a stand up is that the audience shouldn't feel they're being subjected to a lecture or a monologue. They should almost feel as if they're in a conversation, and it's just a matter of coincidence that they haven't had to actually say anything, you know, for a while. 
So there is that sort of sense that you're having a, a kind of rhythmic dance with them and you're pulling them around. You know, you're leading on the dance floor, but you're not. it's not a solo dance. It's more of a waltz. No, no, that's nice. But, it'd be, but you've talked about it, comedy being ephemeral, if you like. Uh, mm. But uh, how do you explain then that you, you've been doing it for over 25 years? Well, uh, the individual can last for a long time. And I mean, Connolly, you know, remained hugely watchable, you know, right up until the diagnosis. Yeah. And uh, a few others sort of come and go. Some of them go away and then come back. I mean, I think Les Dawson, you know, everyone felt was kind of exhausted at the point at which the new comedy came in in the mid 80s. And he was one of those guys in a bow tie and a velvet jacket that was regarded as old hat. And then there was a sudden point about 10 years later when everyone actually yeah, Les Dawson is really funny. You know, he's not he's not just an bitter old misogynist or whatever and he was brought back in and everyone rediscovered his extraordinary sort of lyricism and uh and lovable persona so the persona can but the material itself and there are exceptions to this but the material itself has to it, it is in the present moment i think and it addresses very specific usually anxieties that are predominant in society the extent to which a um a particular topic, you know, suddenly seems to flower up and every comedian needs to have five minutes on being OCD or five minutes on, uh, you know, mixed race relationship or something. And, and then and then a couple of years later, it's gone. Everything that needed to be said about that has been said. And um, and if you try and do material about that subject a few years later, it, unless it's amazing, it is possible to get around it, you know. But if you if you just hear some old material that you wrote at that time and it's all moved on, it's kind of obvious that it has. And also, I mean, for me, I think consciously you have to move through certain stages that reflect your time of life. So when I started out in comedy, I was a, I was a bachelor living in a, uh, you know, initially a shared house in um, in Peckham and then uh, moved and bought my first shabby little one bedroom flat, you know, in King's Cross. But but I was a single man with a certain amount of of liberty, and uh, you know that that was the trade off. Now I'm a you know a, a family man with a with a mortgage and a uh, and a wife and kids, and 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 if I was to carry on trying to present the same kind of material, it just wouldn't work. Nobody would think, you know, you can't you can't be that. Or if you have remained that that cynical and uh, and detached. That must be quite hard for your family. <laughs> well, no, and that, but by the way, isn't that uh, that great humour comes from some kind of authenticity as yeah, well? Where, I think so. where, and you have to believe that that person and the thing, because you know, you you are uh, what I would call you are a teasing comedian. You are, yeah, that's true. You, uh, which is beautiful and I, I I love the whole idea of teasing and I, I worry that it's getting lost because you can't play as much anymore and I love it I mean I do speak to corporate audiences all the time and that thing and I will always be teasing but they yeah I think people are much brighter than you think they know when you've got enough rapport they know when you're playing don't they Yes, I think they do. And I think you can still get away with it. But you're right, people are more anxious about it. The, the, the weird anxiety at the moment in comedy audiences and generally is people are anxious on behalf of other people. So they're not offended themselves, but they're just thinking. So if you're the kind of teasing you're talking about is like a setup that suggests that the punchline might be racist and then the punchline isn't racist. And then you're kind of going, huh, you thought it was going to be, you know, and everyone's like laughing with relief that they haven't been forced into um you know, uh, like supporting or or, or legitimising your uh, your your appalling views or whatever. But now people will be thinking, well, I found it funny, but I, I worry that there might be some people in the audience who were who were alarmed even by the prospect of a of a racist punchline. You know, well, my my first act, as you know, with Morris Meyer in the Majors, when we had yes. our first uh, big hit, it was stutter rap. And we we did get a little bit of people coming backstage, you know, my friend stutters and I'm offended for him type stuff and everything. But I wonder now if stutter rap would even be allowed, even the, yeah. because the joke was the premise was we were rappers, but we had a stutter. So the joke was on us, if yeah. you see what yes. I mean. But yeah, but now. I, I wonder if people would get, well, you can't go there. 
I suppose it, it, it might evolve constantly and it might be a thing that you could say, well, is that cultural appropriation? Patrick Campbell, who was a very, very funny writer and used to be one of the um, regulars on Call My Bluff, has had a terrible stammer. Speak. Absolutely sort of, yeah. And he wrote a very, very funny piece called The Hot Box about when he was a journalist and he was in, encountered another man with, with a similar stammer, but on different letters. And they just sort of, he said they were like a box of fireworks going off in... <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, it is weird weepingly funny but of course if he hadn't himself and you know when you read the book you know he has got a stamina and it is about him it's not some sort of you know so I suppose that already there was that difference but then again you could say uh my generation by the who that probably has the most famous st stutter yeah. in you know oh I know Georgia fade away fade away I and it's it's still electric. I mean, if you play that on Radio One or yeah. Two or whatever now, you still go, "Oh my God!" <laughs> <What's gonna... laughs> it's still exciting, you know. So, um, I think if you if you if you play around it with um, enough skill, I, I say, I mean, I am a little bit anxious that we are losing our sense of humour, but I would say most of the time. If you if you have enough skill, if you have enough dexterity, there is always an edge that you can dance back and forth across, which is where the laughs are, you know. And finally, Simon Evans, your desert island gag. This is a joke which I remember one of the comedians telling on that show, the comedians, Granada TV from the 70s, bit like Dave Allen. Uh, I think Bernard Manning was occasionally on it as well. This one wasn't, I can't remember his name. He was an old George something, George... I might have to go back and check. He used to wear big round, uh, big square framed glasses. And like they all did, he wore his big velvet bow tie and so on. Anyway, it's up in the north. I think, let's say it was Bradford. And there's a, there's a, a haulage firm. And they generally speaking, they just do local jobs. But one day they get a, an order for some wood to be delivered down to an address in London. And um, and one of the drivers agrees to do it, but he's never been to London before. Anyway, he drives down there. It's about five or six hours uh, down down the uh, M1, and he finally gets into uh, Wembley. Let's say <laughs> I'm not telling the joke at all. Well, and um, and he's like, oh, he's completely lost. He has no idea where he is. Obviously, he pulls over to the side of the road. He's got like five tons of, uh, of timber on the back of the truck. Winds the window down, beckons over somebody who's walking up the street, goes, hello, mate. Yeah, hello. Is this London? Goes, yeah. Where do you want this wood? <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of joke has been it's been done in different ways, you know, that kind of, oh, you're going to New York. Do you you know, British people get in America and they're like, oh, you're British. Do you know my cousin? You know, that, but... That, there's something lovely about where do you want this wood? That, again, I would give that the Galton and Simpson uh, level of uh, piss. We had so much to talk about and such a great intellectual and comedic chat that we decided to make another part. Listen out for it in the next podcast. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros, produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.